robot include a number of different things. Uh, if you go to, and I include this in the presentation, we'll put these in the, uh, we'll put these inside the uh, folder for everyone. Uh, there's a number of different reference points that exist. This happens to be from Rev Robotics, but I found a really good diagram showing the different components, electrical components that exist within a robot. Um, we don't have all of these, uh, but we use many of them. So just to give you a very high level overview of what's included on a robot is horse power, right? Coming from the battery, powering the PDU, or sometimes called PDH, power distribution unit. So DC goes in here. Everybody know DC AC? Direct current instead of alternating current or DC and everything that we do. So it's just like a car battery, 12 volts of a car battery. That powers the PDU. This basically takes current from here and spreads it out across everything, but then further adds uh, a variety of different fuses, controls, as well as some telemetry to allow us to know what's going on when we distribute power. Power goes from each of these different fused outputs to a variety of different devices uh, on the robot. You can see here, there could be motor controllers, right? Here's a spark mask. Right, you're used to seeing that on our robots. It can also go, in some cases, directly to motors, Falcon, right, for example. It could go out of these used ones to power, say, a, you know, a Neo separate from, from a Spark Max as well, in some cases, depending on uh, what type of components that you purchase. There are a couple other things that will be powered off this that aren't powered by the big fuses. So these tend to be either, I think, I think we, we were using 30 and 40 amp fuses. Mm -hmm. So um, that refers to the current that's allowed for any one of these individual channels, 30 or 40 amps. So it's taking the full current from here, spreading it out, but then limiting it on each one of these. There's also some smaller outputs here you remember there's small fuses on each of these. Uh, they can power other items as well. So here's the pneumatic unit. If you remember, um, Tyler had one of these in this particular case that was powered off one of these smaller uh, power outputs. You can see on this diagram they're showing gauge, wire gauges. Different wire gauges are specified to handle different amounts of current. So it's typically the largest gauge is where you have the most current. That's what's coming out of the battery. And then you can see larger gauge might be here on the 30 or 40 amp ones, and then smaller gauge might be in some of these other ones. You can see different gauge ratings um, of the different wires that are here. So you have power coming off here, to power the pneumatic hub. That actually then converts this voltage in some cases to other voltages. So what you have coming out here is all 12 volts based upon the battery that's driving this. Sometimes there'll be a voltage converter here. I don't remember if these are powered differently. Um, but then this is actually powering something else following that. If you remember, we had um, a compressor uh, as well as I think there was a relay here. But this is sort of a whole subsystem that they designed um, separately. In some cases, you can have regulated power. So this might be converting power from 12 volts to 5 volts, 3 volts, or other voltages that might be required for other parts in the system. We didn't have that. I don't think we had any of those this year. We've had that in the past. And then, of course, power to power the RoboRio. So the RoboRio, and we'll talk about each of these components in more detail. So this is going to the RoboRio. The RoboRio will power several other things as well. Um, and it'll also have control signals across the different things. Um, we also, I don't remember, we can look on ours, whether we power off here or off there, um, the radio. So we have a radio. The way we power the radio is through power over Ethernet. And this is a voltage converter. So a voltage is coming from here, it's putting that voltage onto the ethernet cable that then powers the radio. So the key components that we have in our system, of course, battery, the PDU, um, the RoboRio, and radio. Those, those you basically have to have on any robot, right? That's the basic pieces that are inside. Everything else probably depends on your design, right? We had pneumatics for a while, we took those off. You know, you can power it this way, you can power it another way. You could have Falcons, you could have Spark Max, you could have all the other things. Um, what you have to do at the end of the day is just make sure that the current is sufficient to drive whatever you're driving when you sort of look across this. And for most of the parts, they specify from first, that'll always be the case. 
Um, and then you want to make sure that there are a variety of regulations which will talk about specifying certain fees and things like that are related to what you're powering in each case. So that's sort of a high level overview of the different components. I'm going to go into a little more detail on several of them. Um, but let me stop here and make sure if people have any questions. Make sense? Okay. And we'll just dive into a couple of the different components. So the power distribution hub, uh, the one that we use is from Rev. We actually upgraded this, was this year or last year? Last year. Last year. Um, there are, I think, a couple that are allowed um, from what First Robotics uh, based on it being manual. This is the one that we use. Um, the uh, spec where you buy it is sort of listed here from Rev Robotics, and then there's fairly detailed documentation here, which is pretty good. That's where I actually got some of these pictures. This goes into, as sort of I highlighted before, a couple of the key characteristics, referring to these as high current channels that we plug in uses here for each of these channels. Um, battery inputs, those are the large ones. You guys have seen the, the voltage here. You can always look at the voltage um, in bright letters there. Uh, the lower current channels, that's where you saw uh, you know, both the Robo Rio, um, as well as sometimes the pneumatic done. There's also what they call a switchable channel. You can actually turn it on and off at a certain speed. We typically have not used that, um, but you could use it for lights or things like that. It doesn't tend to be uh, high current. It's not that fast, but it is something that you can control through the PVU itself, uh, for example. Um, this does have a USB-C, so you can plug in to look at it if you want to. And then it has a uh, CAN here as well. We'll talk about CAN uh, in a second. Any questions on the power distribution? Yeah, but the, are all of the outputs, including the low current channels, are all 12, they're all 12 volts? Off this PDU, yeah. Off this PDU, if I remember correctly. And is there is there a cutoff for the low, what is the cutoff that defines low current versus high current? Um, th there's, there's basically smaller fuses in here. I think the largest one that, that we were using was uh, 20 amps, if I remember correctly. Um, I think you, there's like your car fuses. I think you can actually get higher, but I think I think first limits that. So, so you drive you drive the actual current output by the yeah. Well, I, I, I think I think technically there's a spec on the on the thing. You could look at that. Okay. So that we'll get up later. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. It's probably useful to show people what some of these ones look like. You can go and, and look at them more later. Um, so a lot of these, you know, what what I think many of you have found in general is what you have to do on these things is. Go look them up, find a particular part. It's something we probably bought, um, but you can see here, it'll tell you some uh, additional characteristics, mm -hmm. right? So those 20 support up to 40 amps, mm -hmm. right? This is supporting 15 to 20 amp peak. So what it means by that is that, uh, that you might have a waveform, so that would be voltage in time, and that voltage in time on average could be 15 amps, but you could have a surge or a variation when you turn something on or off that might create a higher peak. Um, so there's some control on that. In general, most fuses will have a little bit of leeway in terms of going over and burning out. They have sort of time constant associated with it. But these are sort of the different types of fuses, ATO, ATM in a particular case. And you can see this one, that's that low current channel that I was, I was talking about. Um, this is describing those main terminals uh, this is describing some of the features that you can start to debug from this, and I'll show you at the end, you can use a uh, Rev Robotics piece of software to be able to look at additional characteristics in real time when this is turned on. That's often useful for debugging. If you don't know what's going on, it can show you things. And you can also, this is part of the, uh, of the CAN loop. You can see here, talking about the CAN connectivity. We'll show you that in a second as well. Um, other characteristics. Uh, if you go back to the, uh, go back to this. There's also pretty good documentation in here as well. So you can see it has um, quite a bit of detail. You can see this is where I put some of the pictures from this. Uh, it'll tell you um, about many aspects. Here's where I got that other picture. So it kind of goes into many aspects of detail there, um, and it'll walk you through. Um, other things too. As probably many of you have done before, you've seen these terminals when you stick stuff in, you pop them up, you stick the wire in, you pop it down, it should hold on. You would want to test each wire independently. That was a problem that we had on, it was actually on the, on the Robo Rio, but we run into this on this as well. And especially when we have a lot of stuff hanging down the way we do, it's important that mechanically it's very sound um, on that. And that also reflects uh, some of those 
you know, wire gauges that we were talking about. You know, if it's too big, it's not going to fit in there. If it's too small, it might not grab onto it. So it's important to be sort of cognizant of that. Um, <laughs> this was actually showing you. If you remember, I remember any of you remember this uh, when we were at one of the competitions. The guy with the crazy list, and we'll talk about the list in a second, was going over everything in arduous detail. He was checking every one of these fuses, where they went, whether we had the right fuse. One of them had a dent, we had to pull it out and replace it. Like, they can be very anal in checking into things like this um, when you go for inspection. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so that gives you a feel for what the PDH is. So next is the, uh, is the Robo Rio. So Robo Rio is uh, this. This is our computer that's on board the, uh, the robot. Uh, it's made by National Instruments. That's a company that makes a variety of test equipment for all sorts of different purposes uh, and software for a lot of testing applications. But they make specialized stuff specifically for FIRST. This is actually designed, like I don't think you could buy a Robo Rio 2 other than for FIRST or for a very specialized industrial application. You can't just order it uh, as a general thing. So it's specified entirely from uh, first. Uh, the way it actually works, which may be interesting to some people, is it's not a, a standard computer per se. It's actually what's called a FPGA, uh, Field Programmable Gate Array. So it's made by Xilinx. So inside here, there's a chip. And that chip is actually something that can do real programming. So it's, a, it's an ASIC that allows flexibility in terms of reprogramming. Inside the chip, what they do is they put in two, they're called ARM cores. So it's actually a computer based on the ARM architecture. They have two of those cores inside the Xilinx FPGA. That Xilinx FPGA, you can also program a variety of other inputs and outputs, which is sort of all the stuff that you see around here. Um, so it's not like just an Intel PC inside. It's a little bit different. It's designed for a specialized application. A lot of what National Instruments does is take something like an FPGA and then put together pieces like this around it and then provide that as a functioning unit for a variety of applications. If you're interested in sort of the compute characteristics here, um, you know, it's an 866 megahertz chip. So like a lot of your PCs now are probably several gigahertz in terms of clock time inside there. So it's not the fastest, but it's not that bad. This is relatively recent. I think it was two, three years ago um, that they offered the Robo Rio 2. We were on the Robo Rio 1. At that competition when we were on 1, we were basically maxing out the compute and resources on the Robo Rio 1. When we switched to this, we didn't have a problem anymore. So the compute that was available on here made a difference. Uh, in terms of memory, uh, there's both uh, 16 megabytes of non-viable, volatile, and 512 megabytes of DDR3, as well as um, uh, a micro SD. So that's sort of where you store most of it. Just from a stack perspective, it's actually running National Instruments real-time Linux OS. So if you think about computers that you're running, you know, you have a Mac OS, I have Windows. Um, this is just another variant, although it's what they refer to as real-time Linux. A lot of what National Instruments does is things related to test instrumentation, so timing is very important. So the operating system is optimized for that, uh, as well as the compute associated with it. When you look at the National Instruments uh, device, you can see a lot of different interfaces around it with a variety of different form factors as well as purpose. We don't actually use all of these. We use some of these. Different years, we use different interfaces. So, you know, there's a USB to talk to it. There's power to power it. This actually, this is what this is what was loose. It all thought she screwed this down and did, and it popped out, and so the whole thing failed once. Um, uh, an SD slot, so you can put something in if you actually want to manually upload software. Uh, two other USB um, ports that are regular USBs. Ethernet. This is how we primarily talk to. Um, the National Instruments device. We saw in that earlier diagram when we looked at the robot. This goes from here to the power over Ethernet thing to the radio. So signals from our main computer are going in here through the Ethernet. Uh, SPI is an interface that, that we typically have not used, but it allows someone to be able to um, communicate over a, a, a serial bus, essentially. There's several LEDs that give status. These are useful if you're trying to do bug sensing. Um, there's PWN, which is pulse width modulation control. We typically have not used these, but it's a method to be able to send signals across uh, different devices. 
mounting features. We've tried to use these not very well. We typically stuck a, uh, you know, a little zip tie around those to try and get it on. I think there might be um, mounting holes in the back as well. I don't know if you've ever done that. Um, both reset buttons here, you can actually use that if you're manually debugging. Um, analog outputs uh, versus uh, digital I.O. So analog means you can create waveforms with an arbitrary voltage. Um, we typically do not use these, uh, but you could. Um, that's, uh, I'm sorry, these are analog inputs. They can take arbitrary uh, waveforms uh, coming in. Typically what you do is digitize on the other side to be able to measure something that would be non-digital. So instead of just ones and zeros, it's something that might be going up and down like that. Um, relay control typically to turn off and other things. Um, RSL, this is basically the light that goes on our robot, the flashing light when it's going on. Um, we actually do the DIO, digital input output. So this is taking either ones and zeros in or sending zeros and ones out. We're using these for uh, the motor encoders. Uh, I think I think those are the only four. Actually, we used we used it once for the um, color sensors here, didn't we? So we we use these occasionally. Um, RS232 is another bus. I squared C is another bus, and then PAN. Uh, so so basically, there's a bunch of different formats and interfaces that you could use. There's only some that we do use. Um, this port is where we would plug in the, um, the uh, accelerometer board that we had that would allow us to uh, determine uh, direction and uh, tilt and things like that. So that's an optional component. I think, have we always, I think we've always had that on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we've always used that with our sorter. So that's basically the, uh, the robo here. Any questions on kind of the components of this? We don't use all of them, but it's important to understand kind of what's available there. So this is similar, I put in the links here for um, both the proc description from uh, National Instruments. Uh, this website is not as useful, I would say, in general. Um, you know, they do have some of the specs here, some of the ones that I called out, some of the other ones that are listed here. Um, so if there's something that you need to look up, you could. These are mostly hardware specs. They're not so much um, uh, characteristics in terms of programming against it and things like that. More of the um, programming stuff you can actually find primarily because it's designated for first. You find that sort of with WPI Web and other things. Now, one thing that you should note, um, oops, that you should note with respect to the Robo Rio is that each year you typically have to image your Robo Rio. So, so the way something like the Robo Rio works for an FPGA is that there's a there's a firmware image, and what that means that is that's basically the, the software that's controlling that Xilinx processor. So each year what typically happens is something important changes in terms of the way FIRST wants something to work with the Robo Rio. The National Instruments updates the firmware. And what you have to do is basically go through a sequence uh, updating the Robo Rio. This will typically come out with the uh, software that they start to publish. Um, and they have a little tool associated with the uh, I'm trying to what they call it, the National Instruments FRC tool pack, uh, basically. So you'll download an image, uh, it'll be here, and then they sort of have a sequence that they outline here. Um, that image was available a little bit before um, the kickoff, although you know, typically that's in an early phase that's designed for only certain people to test, uh, and then at kickoff you're going to want to modify to this. I think most years we've been able to use the older image to get started. Some years I think some of the upgrades have been required. So that's something that you often have to go through as part of the start of the season when you're first trying to look at the uh, Robo Rio. And there's a little tool that's on one of the computers. You connect to it. I think it was through USB. I don't remember exactly. Um, you make sure that you've downloaded the image from a National Instruments. Often all this is included in that initial library that you download anyway. Eric, I seem to recall on the first day of the competition, the, ro the robot was getting flashed before it. Is that, was that? Part of this? Uh, so, no, you're probably thinking, we'll talk about it in a second, you're probably thinking about the radio. Um, we did actually, uh, there are a couple things as part of uh, the inspection procedure, I believe they do look at um, the firmware version of the Robo Rio. We had done that. Um, they do look at the version of uh, um, driver station. That was one that we had to upgrade. I don't know if you guys remember that. We brought over a USB and we had to put that on our laptop. Um, but every time you go to a competition, you flash the radio. So that's where we got in the line and we flash something. So there's, there's firmware for several different components. Um, typically, and I'll, I'll show you later uh, through some of the tools that we have, 
we'll typically go through and update the firmware and everything at some point. Um, that includes, you know, the Sparks, the Falcons, the uh, PDH, LabVIEW, everything. Uh, it's often best to be using their, their latest versions. Okay. Any other questions on World Zero? So the radio, which is what Gary was just asking about. You've seen this sitting in uh, the robot. It's called the OM5PAC. I didn't uh, know that. I looked that up. Um, there are some lights on it that you can see. Uh, you've probably noticed before when you try and first turn on the robot, it takes a while um, for first the robot to boot up, but also for this to turn on sufficiently. So typically you'll see the power light come on and eventually the Wi-Fi light come on. You won't be able to talk to it until that Wi-Fi light is on typically. It might even be after that. Uh, it takes a little bit of while, a time for it to connect. What happens in that overall diagram though is that you should note is that usually this will come up first and what will happen is you'll connect your computer to this. So this is just your Wi-Fi talking to whatever it is, you know, uh, our, our was our team member? I don't remember what the robot is, what the uh, connection. You'll connect to this, but that just means that your computer is talking to this. It's not necessarily talking to the National Instruments yet. So what often happens when you turn on the power is nothing's working at first, then this boots up, you connect to this, but this isn't up yet. So until that's up and you get software on it, you have something that's running. So all those things sort of have to work in sequence before you can actually um, make anything happen with the robot. So a couple of characteristics here. I don't know how familiar people are with uh, <coughs> with Wi-Fi. Um, Wi-Fi is what all your computers are using to talk wirelessly in here. Uh, this is what's called 802.11. <coughs> um, that's the standard related to it. There's a couple different variants of it: BGN, AN, AC, etc. Um, there's different frequencies as well: 2.4 gig, 5 gig. All this means are just different waveforms that are used to communicate with that radio signal from the computer to this thing. This supports several, they specify certain ones. That's part of the reason why they use the firmware is to make sure everything is locked in together. Um, you can see this is a 12 volt, that's, that's easy. It can be po uh, powered either through a voltage here or through the actual ethernet connections. Typically ethernet is not Powered, you, you will typically see PoE specifically, which means power over Ethernet. A power over Ethernet connector uses the same connector, but some of these are live with voltage signals that allow you to power things. Um, you know, most of the connections that you have in here or other places are typically not PoE. They're typically labeled very explicitly as such. Um, in our system, what we do, and you can see it in a second, is this little converter that's sitting here, right, takes the voltage from here, essentially puts it onto those pins. It passes the signal pins here. It adds these to the appropriate power over Ethernet pins, and that powers this radio. You could, and we have at different times, power directly into that other port, um, but we often use the power over Ethernet one. You could go either way. So, um, the other characteristics here, you know, you'll hear people talk about, and this doesn't matter so much for uh, first per se, um, but this is actually what's called a MIMO antenna, which means that there's actually um, two sets of two um, antennas that are designed to be orthogonal to give you uh, specialized coverage and better um, control over how you communicate with it. Um, what's really relevant to us is you gotta get into <laughs> The signal from this thing, right? The computer's talking to this, this is sending the signal back to the to the Robo Rio and then back and forth. So it's a bi-directional signal going over here to 11. So it's very similar to what all your PCs are doing um, here. There are newer, much newer 80211 versions that'll be like six by six, eight by eight, stuff like that that can work even more effectively. Um, this also has the links to this particular um, radio characteristics. Right, so this is an Anymark uh, version. It gives you some of the uh, characteristics and specifications around this. You have CAD files, etc. The more important thing is is flashing it. So as all of you have experienced, um, there's sort of a tool that FRC uses. Um, 
Yeah, there's basically a tool uh, that you install on the computer. It's it's on those computers there. There's sort of a sequence uh, to flashing and then setting up specific firmware. Uh, when we go to competition, they'll put one set on. We'll come back and often have to flash back to what we will use. The reason they're doing that is in competition, they want to carefully control who gets on the network uh, associated with the field. So the way these wireless um, access points work is that they're, they can be designated to particular channels and frequencies. Like I said, there's 2.4 and 5 gig, and then within each of those, there's several different channels. All the channels are different frequencies around that carrier frequency. So you know, if 2.5 is the carrier frequency, you have channels like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so they're very careful. If five people are on channel one, you're interfering with each other, and it messes up your signals. So what they're trying to do on the field is control who has which channel to make sure they all get uh, equal quality. I don't think they're using, you can also use um, what's essentially called QoS, sort of controls on how much bandwidth each robot gets. So for instance, we've encountered this in the field. We have a whole bunch of imagery going on the robot, and we're trying to send it out to our computer. That uses up a lot of bandwidth. So they also control how much bandwidth different people get on the field as well. So that can impair uh, how the robot performs. In many cases, we've actually encountered that. And what happens is when we're testing here without the field and other robots around, we don't notice any problem. We get on the field and we have this one channel and there's all the other robots competing and they limit the amount of bandwidth, suddenly we have a problem. So that's something that we have to be aware of and be cognizant of. We don't do anything with the, with the uh, wireless access point to to affect that, that's sort of controlled by FRC, but we have to be cognizant of it. I think in the manual they talk about some of the bandwidths that you can get on the field and assumptions you can make. And there are a number of tools within uh, Driver Station that will show you uh, the bandwidth that you're consuming at any given time. Any questions from radio? Yeah? Um, so once the computer connects to the radio, does it like send information to the radio that then sends it to the RoboVia? The, the, um, the, the radio access point is really only at like layer two and three. So uh, what that means is your application is communicating from the driver station to the program that's on the RoboRio. Uh, in between, uh, this is terminating an ethernet signal and then resending a radio signal. On top of that, and that's called layer two, on top of that would be layer three, which is basically packets that would go to end to end. But what you're talking about is really the application itself. So it's sort of above all those layers of the protocol stack. And so it, it, it's not really communicating with it per se. There is a ethernet driver on the RoboRio that creates an ethernet frame. That ethernet frame goes to here, it's terminated here. It creates a radio frame that goes to you know, the radius access point that, that creates uh, an Ethernet frame that goes across the cable that connects to our thing. So it's going across several jumps of these protocols, but for our purpose, it's an end-to-end -end connection from the laptop to the RoboRio. Okay. Answer your question? Kind of. Kind of? Okay. So it doesn't go through the radio to get to the RoboRio, it just goes directly to the RoboRio? Uh, it, 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 well, uh, not, it doesn't have to go through the radio, it doesn't go directly to the RoboRio. But. It's not... Um, Parts of the protocol stack are being terminated by the radio, but the, the information that you're sending from the FRC driver station gets to and is not stopped at uh, the radio. So it goes all the way to LabVIEW. So at one level, it's the application in um, the RoboRio is sending, uh, hey, Edo, all the way to our computer. Two layers down, it puts it in some packets, they get here, they go there. Another layer down, it goes into a frame that terminates, that terminates, but the payload stays the same across those. So it's just the network protocol stack. <coughs> so, so this is dumb, is the way you should look at it. This, this, is, this is, it's just terminating some ethernet is all it's doing. It's not really doing much more. It doesn't understand code. It only right. understands Yeah, we don't terms. code it at all. Yeah, it does not understand the code. The code that we do goes on the, only on the RoboVideo on the robot. Oh. Any other questions? Right. So CAN bus, all right, so we'll talk about CAN a little bit. So CAN on this are the green and yellow wires that are running all over the place. And uh, many of the devices, not all the devices, are part of the CAN bus. And essentially what that's doing is daisy chaining together, which just means 
this goes to 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 goes to this. So they're just in a sequence one after the other. Go ahead. Is daisy chaining bad? Because I remember from like bigger tables that daisy chaining is bad. Is it like different with the smaller tables on the robot? Uh, it just it, it depends. Uh, in this case, there are some specifications around how many devices can be on the CAN bus. Uh, each one can be sending information. Each one has a certain amount of impedance. So there's a limit on how many devices that you can have associated with a particular CAN bus that you're working with. There are also specifications around uh, the termination resistance. So the way in which uh, the impedance that you have at the start and the end uh, of the entire chain. So there's some constraints on it, but generally it's not a problem. The bigger issue is the amount of bandwidth that you put across it. When we put um, you know, too much telemetry, too much information on it, it can overload the CAN bus, and then you don't get all the information across it. So that, that's where you can have a problem. It's less related to the thickness of the wires. The thickness of the wires will introduce some level of impedance, so that might affect how many things you put on there, um, but it's not current. Usually the thickness of the wires is related to the current that you're sending. CAN is very low current. So coming out of the battery, you have the big wires, high current. The CAN bus, they can be really little wires, low current. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So there's a bunch of different um, CANs out there. The one that FRC uses is what's called CAN-FD. And there's some references here. Um, but what CAN is uh, um, referring to, and, and I'll show you. You can, you can look on Wikipedia if you want to see more about CAN. But CAN is actually most common on your car. So it's sort of the control network that's on the car, um, but it's used a lot of other places in general. And you, know, you can see it here, it's like controller area network bus. Um, and what it's really talking about is, um, what it's really talking about are the signals that are sent across the wires. So when you refer to the CAN, it's referring to a sequence of ones and zeros that are sent across the wires. So at each of these devices, it can basically toggle them high-low. That's a one or a zero. Um, and then the pattern in which it toggles is specified by the CAN uh, spec, FD in this case. And the way it works is that there's a sequence that are expected by each of the different CAN devices, and that sequence includes specific items. You're going to have a one that's going to be your starter frame. There's an ID which might be associated. I think that's actually the CAN device itself that you're on. Um, there's uh, RTR. There is then your data payload. So this is like common. Every time you send, every time one of your things wants to send some information, it starts with this. Hey, I'm device number one. I'm starting a frame. I'm doing this. Okay, I'm going to tell you. Um, this is the information I'm telling you. Uh, I have a I have a broken something or other. And then there's a CRC, which basically is the way to cross-check all this in case you screwed something up and acknowledge and then to frame. So this is like a sequence of bits that everybody on the CAN bus is listening for. If you follow this sequence, you identify yourself, and whoever's listening for it knows what you sent. What that looks like in real life, this is sort of the, the, the frame itself, what it looks like in real life are these waveforms. So if you if you could take an oscilloscope and look at what voltages are on the two different CAN wires, you would see this, right? You would see there's two wires, you look at the two of them, you look at the difference, and you would see there's a there's zero, 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 there's a one, there's a one. And then you take all this, this sequence of ones and zeros, the CAN encoder that's on each of these devices it would strip off this stuff. Oh, it's it designated for me. I'm listening for this. It would look at this, and then it could parse that data payload. So this is how the CAN's working physically. This is this is this is the physical layer. This is voltage going on and off, and it's sending those across this. When we daisy chain, as Jack was discussing, any of these devices might be sending stuff, and all the other devices can hear it. So. You can only have so many devices that are doing that because you're sharing that medium. Because as soon as I toggle here, everybody else might be seeing that, right? And in our case, usually what's happening is the data from the CAN is being listened to or sent from primarily to RoboRio. That's where our software is running. And so it's how it's sending signals to 
each of the different motors to tell them what to do. It's all across this. This is how we're communicating to different devices um, on, on the robot. So when you think about the comm overall, what's happening is from the computer, Matthew says go forward. That comes in through wireless here. It goes to ethernet here, but still saying go forward. And then our software converts that into, okay, uh, Falcon one, two, three, four, do this, this, and this. That'll be a CAN signal that gets to here across the whole bus and it'll send them out to each of the different Falcons. So, you know, you're going to here, the software is doing something to convert that into uh, a command to the Falcon. That command is being carried across the CAN bus to get there. Same thing goes in the other direction. If there's an encoder or something like that, that might go back this way. Um, it depends on the particular device. In the case of the Falcon, that might go across the CAN bus. As we talked about in the case of the, um, um, the swerve drive and other encoders, that can sometimes go into the DIO. That's another way to get information back. But that's, that's an individual connection as opposed to a daisy chain connection that goes to the whole place. Jack has a question. Yeah. Where would we find information about the limits of the cables that we can apply to the robot? Yeah, I think, um, oops, over here. That's one of the reasons why I left this one. Um, WPI Lib actually has quite a bit of information along these lines and talks about that. So there's a variety of resources here. Um, the, one of the important things to note uh, is what's called termination. So. The, oh, you actually, you can kind of see it here. Um, when you look at, CAN has to start, starter end, starter end from um, the robo reel, and starter end from the, the PDH, and those devices by default uh, have, a, have a different termination resistance. So there's a difference between the guys at the end and the ones in the middle in terms of impedance, and that changes the characteristics of it. That's part of the thing that dictates it. Um, I think within the WPI docs, there, are, there is some information about that. I know when we looked at the Canivore um, as an option, that also specified some limits in terms of what it could handle. So I think that had some documentation around it as well. Um, in general, uh, so just to back up, uh, last year we had a number of devices, and at times we thought our CAN bus might have been overloaded with information. That was one of the reasons why we looked at buying the Canivore, which is basically um, a device that will run another, a second uh, CAN bus uh, on the robot. And the way that device will work is, you know, one CAN bus is coming through here. That CAN board would go through the USB and then start a different CAN path. And so now, as I was talking about before, you know, if you have 10 devices and they're all trying to send information on the same wire, they're all in contention. If you can separate them out, to this other USB, then you have two parallel tracks. You can get twice as much uh, bandwidth potentially. At the end of the day, you're probably limited by the compute that you also have on the national instruments. So when you look at some of the debug uh, that you get through fiber station, uh, you'll notice that that can happen too. That's your question? Yes. Okay. Any other questions on Canvas? Okay. Um, I wanted to show, uh, and we'll do this with the robot afterwards just to give everybody an idea of how this works. There's a couple different debugging things that we'll often use. Um, there's two of them for this sort of physical level stuff uh, that involve both telemetry associated with particular devices, but also um, firmware upgrades. So I was showing before that we have a dedicated program to do a firmware upgrade on the RoboReel, another one associated with the radio. Um, for almost all the other devices, we're getting them from either Rev or CTR and they each have a program that will do stuff. Um, one is the Rev hardware client, and that allows you to debug both CAN, but it also allows you to interface with individual devices. So when you're debugging, what you often do, and you can't figure out something, is you can use this external tool without having to go into um, your code that's running on the RoboReel to be able to see the different devices that are on the CAN bus, and then in many cases actually debug their state or check their firmware level. So when we have problems, I'll often use one of these tools to be able to do that. Um, because they're two different uh, companies, you often have to use one or the other depending on what you're trying to debug. Both of them will often tell you if something's just on the bus. Um, but if you want to see additional telemetry associated with the device, you have to use the specific tool. 
Um, so the Rev Hardware Client, PDH, and Spark Max, um, the Phoenix Tuner X now, um, is often for the Talons and for the Pneumatics. Um, I can show you how both of those work. But what happens on these is you can sort of drill down into these and it'll give you other information. So for instance, when you burnt out motors or thought we had a bad Spark device, there are some software failures and there are some hard failures. So we'll often look at this if something's going wrong to try and figure out what's specifically wrong, and that's often helped us understand. You can also use this to set um, flash settings associated with these devices. Uh, if you remember, some of you may remember from last year, we were hanging the robot and it wasn't in um, stop mode, what do you call it? Um, break mode. Huh? Break mode. Break mode. Break mode was a firmware setting on one of these. You can sometimes override it with software as well, but in that case I think we didn't. But you can set it here, and I remember that was how we initially debugged it. We thought we weren't sure it was in break mode. We used this, we saw it wasn't. We tried it, and it actually changed the way that thing behaved. So it's actually a good way to uh, debug items like that. But we'll open it up and show you how it actually works on the robots. So check it out. Other questions on debugging these? No? I want to mention one of the common things you um, it's a duplicate conflict IDs. That if you have two devices with the same ID, they're going to try to consume the same messages, and they're just going to. That's right. They're going to. Yeah, if you remember, conflict. if you remember the, right, the way the CAN bus works, is that you're sending a packet based on your ID. So if there's two things sending it based on the same ID, like everybody's confused, right? Yeah. So you know the software might interpret, oh, I'm getting this weird signal from uh, the Spark when it's actually something else, and it can definitely be a problem. So, so we'll often this is also used. That CAN ID is set in the firm in the uh, flash of the individual devices. So if the IDs are wrong, you need to use this to change the ID, to reflash it, uh, and then you try again for the day. So that's another. That's a good. That's a good point. That's often debugged before we go to the go to the competition because we forget what things are set to. Um, hopefully, we don't do that in the competition. We have had to do that when we replace. So oftentimes, if one of these devices fail. We, we swap it out, but the one we bring in is the wrong number. We don't want to change it in the software, so we'll change it uh, and flash it with the device. So that's a good example of that. Um, these, the, both these programs are pretty good now. Um, there used to be what was called just the Phoenix Tuner itself. I think the Phoenix X is a little bit better. Um, I'm not, I haven't used it quite as much as I have used the Rev, um, but both of them allow you to kind of check, just like you'd expect to check for updates and check for firmware. So it's actually easier than like the LabD flashing or the radio flashing. In that case, you often have to go to the website, find the right thing, put it in your computer, then upload it there. This is kind of, so long as you're connected to the internet, you can do this pretty easily. So the last thing I, I, I was interested in doing was uh, looking at that crazy inspection form. So I remember spending so much time with that guy and I was like, I want to go look at that form and see what's actually there. I found it, um, it's, it's on the uh, website and Kind of interesting when you look at it. Um, there's sort of high level. There's there's two things to note. One is that this form and each of the items on it essentially links to a very specific item in the game manual. So you know this is saying okay check for this. It's associated with R502 and R710. You can cross index that with 502 in the game manual. You know so this is saying. You know, none may be modified except for motor mounting. And you go look here and it says, hey, motor must not be modified. So, so everything they were going down that list, for the most part, um, they'll cite very specific items uh, within the game manual. Now, as you all know, you've read the game manual, so you should be familiar with all the numbers. <laughs> no problem, right? <laughs> but if you're not, it's fine. You can actually use this as an index to figure out what they're talking about. At least what I found is that the game manual is typically more verbose than this like two pager that's in tiny little text. So it can be very helpful to compare those two. The checklist, because it's based on the game manual, will change each year. Um, but most of the things in this checklist are pretty invariant, right? Because most of the stuff related to safety doesn't change too much from year to year. It's still the same type of batteries, the same amount of current, you know, stuff like that. Um, if you look at this form, The form itself has both you know, physical inspection items uh, as well as electrical inspection items. If you start to look at the um, 
electrical inspection items, right? Can't modify, battery of a certain type, secured. Um, you know, talk about other device or computing. We, we, you know, this, this, this would have been uh, more germane to uh, like um, the limelight, for example, which we didn't do. Uh, we were just using the USB panel, which was pretty small. That would kind of apply here. Um, PPPDH uh, visibility. So you have to see the breakers and fuses, right? So he was actually suggesting, if, if you remember, uh, he was suggesting we should have flipped this and had another cover over it so it'd be easier to, to diagnose things like that. Um, but as far as I can tell, that, that was the most uh, anal inspection I've ever encountered uh, at first. But, but we passed it, which is good. Um, uh, main breaker, that's a big one. We make sure that that's accessible. Um, these are the, the fuses that he was specifying. Um, the radio, you want to make sure that that's powered a certain way. And you can see the LEDs. I'm surprised we passed that. You can kind of see those. <laughs> uh, the can, uh, they basically insist, if, even if you weren't to use can and use something else, you still need to have RoboRio to the PDH PDU connected, which is fine. Um, they want RoboRio to be dedicated, so a single line on that. One thing that you can do with DC power is you can connect, it's a bus, you can connect a lot of stuff on it. They don't want you to do that. Part of this is because um, they're trying to enforce best practices so you don't have a bad experience. So some of this is just to do that. We spent a lot of time on these ones, if you remember. Um, they were very specific on uh, wire size as well as the, uh, the size of the fuses in different cases and so they're you know for instance i think we had to swap out um where are those on this one we had to swap out for a, a different breaker i think we had a i get a 15 split through 20 i don't remember which way it was we had a fuse for us that we had to swap out um wire color what we could have done that's pretty easy um you could use something other than copper but that's what we use um one per terminal he was definitely checking this to make sure we weren't sharing several items like that. There are specified liquid motors, but we always stick with those as well. Um, similar for uh, solenoids um, as well, and then actuators, um, motor controllers. We weren't using PWM. Um, we didn't really do anything heavily custom. Pneumatic controller, they spent some time, you can see there's a whole set of pneumatic items there, but both from the controller and then you had a whole set of pneumatic things to test uh, that we went through at that point. Um, connects the can. This one he actually tested, uh, they were looking for uh, isolation on the frame. So they wanna make sure that the frame isn't connected to the electrical, so that, so that you, know, you can't hurt anybody. Um, but it's also good practice because a lot of times you can get uh, interference related to that if there's other things going on. So there's this whole list of things. The, the other ones are in here too, um, but uh, they're, they're fairly um, specific to those areas. So I just focus on this area. So, so that's how all the electronics kind of translates into the power station itself. So any, any questions from that? Okay. I think that was my last slide. Then I was gonna just take you through um, everything on the robot itself. So if there are no questions there, let's switch over to the robot. We'll have to turn it on and then we'll pull out and let people see what it looks like to use the, um, the depot tools. <laughs> 